Alex here with part 220 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As my previous videos, I'll take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part zero if you haven't seen it yet. That's a video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are, number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. And that's because my extra rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is to give my viewers one big example of my eight-year-long high-conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. We go into a motion that I filed that was meant to seize some of my ex's monies that were held in the custody of the Department of the Treasury. I think all states have this, Nevada for sure. They have this program. Um, different states may have different names for it, but in Nevada, it's called, I think it's called the Unclaimed Property Division within the Secretary of Treasury. And they just keep a bunch of people's stuff that just hasn't been claimed. And I have some suspicions, some suspicions as to why um, people submit things to the unclaimed property division. I say people, but it's probably 99.9% .9 corporations. Ordinary people would probably just keep stuff. If somebody, if they owed somebody money and they just couldn't find that person to pay them back, they'd probably just keep it. Um, corporations and companies, I think have reasons for why they turn things over to the unclaimed property division. And I think it has to do with protecting them from lawsuits and other things, um, perhaps protecting them from having to pay taxes on the monies and stuff like that. These are all suspicions that I have. The main purpose of this video is not to talk about these suspicions, but to talk about the program, what it does and how I tried to seize my ex's money from the program. Um, the program holds on to stuff that you have for whatever reason not claimed and some company hasn't been able to pay you back for Again, whatever reason, maybe you moved away. They don't know where you live anymore, something like that. Um, I've claimed things from the Unclaimed Property Division. In fact, I think it would be really cool for all of you to go on their website and check. And if you find stuff, post it in the comments below because that's money for you that you wouldn't have known about and you know about now because you watched this video um, today. So <laughs> um, when I found out about the Unclaimed Property Division, I went on the website, I put in my name and I found all kinds of, of refunds that were owed to me from maybe a cell phone company bill or a cable company bill, maybe even a part of a paycheck, uh, something like that. I, I found quite a bit of stuff. It, was, uh, it wasn't like thousands of dollars, but it was a few hundred. And then I found some for my wife as well. Again, not that much. But yeah, a cool challenge for all of you. Go out there and uh, check on that uh, website and post down in the comments below if you actually got some money back. Um, sometimes I would even go in there and look for friends and family and I would find stuff and then I would send them emails and say, hey guys, you know, send it to my mom or dad or whoever and let them know they have money and that's just sitting around in the unclaimed property division. It's pretty easy to get it back. You fill out a form and they just mail it to you. They mail you a check after a long time. It's not very quick, but you do get it back. Anyway, I looked at my ex's name. I noticed she had some money in that program and I decided, hey, I've been working at collections for a while. And so I should try and see if I can seize this too. It seemed logical to me that if money is held by an employer or a bank or anything similar, you can seize that money. So you should be also able to seize money from the unclean property division. Um, there's a bunch of statutes on how this is done. At least I think there was. I can't remember now. We're going to go through my documents, so we'll be able to check then. But um, if I remember correctly, there is a way to go about this. Um, maybe it's just a case. Maybe there's a case that I pulled from somewhere. I think it was from another state and I was trying to get it to apply to Nevada too and all that. It, it's a lot of work in the legal sense, but at the same time, I had just won two appeals and I felt like I was learning a lot about the legal system and I felt like it's fair. If your ex owes you $100 and they won't pay you back and the unclaimed property division has $100 that they're holding for your ex, it's very fair and logical to say, hey, why don't you just give that to me instead and I'll just apply it towards their debt. Nobody out there is going to think that that's a shocking thing. Um, anyway, um, yeah, let's actually um, at this point in time go ahead and take a look at what I have filed. Here we have the motion for designation of entitlement to property held in the custody of the unclaimed property division. So it looks like what I'm trying to do is get the judge to designate to the unclaimed property division that I am entitled to the money held um, that is um, 
the property of my ex. It looks like just from cursory glance. Um, standard introductory paragraph, I introduce myself to the court. I indicate that I'm appearing a proper person, which is, means that I do not have an attorney and that I am filing this motion. Here's my summary. I retain sole custody of my son. My ex's parental rights were terminated. She's a judgment debtor and she owes me $500 in costs. I'm seeking to obtain a designation of entitlement to my ex's property. Um, again, guys, pretty straightforward stuff. Um, I'm seeking to obtain the information of any and every depositor to have turned funds over to the state collection and disbursement unit as well. Okay, I forgot about this. The reason that I was trying to find out who had paid money to the SCDU is because then I could send a writ of garnishment to whoever that person was. So I'm curious to see how the judge responded on this as well. I don't remember doing this. I do remember going after the, the unclaimed property money though. Uh, factual background. Let's see, I entered, or the court entered an order granting motion for costs, total of $500. Um, I filed a notice of entry of order. To date, my ex has not made a payment on the judgment. She owes for over three years now a modest sum of costs in this case. Now I'm saying modest because it's specific to this case here. Oh, no, wait, no, wait. Oh, I'm mentioning the other case. Okay, I see. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So I'm mentioning that she's failed to make a payment on this judgment and that she also owes money um, on the other judgment as well, though it's a lower amount. Judgment creditors, rights, and entitlements generally. Statutes permitting execution against specific, uh, specific <laughs> specified <laughs> kinds of property must be liberally construed for the benefit of creditors. The general rule is that if the interest is assignable or transferable, it is subject to execution. Um, this is a case, Sports Co. Entertainment. Um, okay, that's just a general overarching principle that they um, are wanting judges to interpret any statutes that entitle you to seizing assets to interpret those liberally in favor of seizing those assets. The onus is on my ex, not me or the court, to bring any claimed exemptions before the court through the appropriate procedure, right? So there's a statute, it's 12, uh, sorry, it's 21.112, and it's discussed in Mackie v. Chong, and that explains that judgment debtors may be exempt to execution, but they have to themselves do certain things to trigger those exemptions, with rare exceptions. Um, it's not our job as the judgment creditor to speculate as to how their defenses may come up or what kind of exemptions may come up. That's not our job. It's our job to seize the money. It's their job as the judgment debtor to try and prevent that from occurring. And um, I think I have a video on the topic if you guys want to learn more about it. I think it's under affidavits claiming exemption. Um, check out that video. It should be under the legal nuts and bolts category. To the extent that the court may deem these collection efforts included within the definition of domestic relations matter matters under 16.21, the same rules provide this court with the discretion to control when post-judgment discovery can occur and to what extent. Basically, I'm trying to make sure that this court doesn't refuse to open discovery because, oh, well, it's a child custody case and you can't do that. I'm trying to mention that there is a rule that does say that sort of, but there's also a, a subsection in that rule that says the court has the discretion um, to open post-judgment discovery. The reason I am mentioning that is because it looks like I want to send a subpoena ducus tecum to the SCDU. Um, looks like that's what I'm trying to do with that compare this case examination of the state collection and disbursement unit it's a creature of law it consists of a fund which accepts an obliger's child support payments and disperses those to the obligee the fund is managed by a chief as designated by the department of Cha uh, department of family services the law defines the chief and designates the department of family services as controlling the division and then I also set another law which authorizes the administrator to adopt regulations and carry out the chapter, as well as another law which defines the administrator. Uh, DCFS is a creature of the Department of Health and Human Services. I cite another law, another two laws, actually. And I wonder why I'm doing this. It might be because I'm going to ask to examine the person who's in charge of this um, section to give me the answers that I need. After almost two years of not being able to locate my ex, the SCDU has recently begun to receive child support payments from what is likely to be her employer. I'm a judgment creditor. I'm entitled to the information detailing who the depositor employer is because then I, who have a cost judgment against my ex, can also 
separately file a writ of garnishment to, to collect on this money as well. If you want to know more about what I'm talking about, watch my video on the topic execution and asset seizure. I explain the process in which an ordinary person who wins a lawsuit can go uh, can go about collecting money that's owed to them, as opposed to having the district attorney's office, child support enforcement division do it for you, which I can't do because the $500 that are owed to me aren't child support, they're cost awards. I'm intending to serve, Ro okay, so yeah, I, I figured what I was gonna try and do. I'm intending to serve Ross Armstrong, the administrator of DF DCFS with a subpoena to answer the relevant questions at issue. And then I cite a law here that indicates how I can serve that. And additionally, I'm intending to serve subpoenas due because Tegan's requesting same information. And should the response by DCFS satisfy the information required, I will move to vacate any upcoming hearing scheduled by the court in order to preserve judicial resources. Seizure of property held in the custody of the Secretary of Treasury. The unclaimed property division is administrated by the Secretary, I cite this law, and they take custody of unclaimed property and turn it over to a claimant where appropriate. Unclaimed property and an unpaid judgment collide in this marital dissolution case. Nice, I found the perfect case, but it's not in Nevada. It looks like it's in Florida. So in Florida, this exact issue came up. Somebody in a marital dissolution case, divorce, was owed money and they wanted to see if they could get that money from the unclaimed property division. Uh, this is statement leads the publication that should control on this issue. Analogous with the aforementioned case, I'm trying to seize my ex's assets currently held in the Secretary of Treasury's unclaimed property division. As neither our uh, statutory nor our case authority sheds light on this question, we should look to the extra. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that since there isn't a case in Nevada, we should look to extra, extra jurisdictional authority, which would be Florida, to, to guide uh, their determination here. And I mention this because I'm citing my own case, Falcone v. Secretary of State. If you guys remember correctly, the case that I was published on had the same issue come up. There wasn't any case law in Nevada to help the Supreme Court of Nevada figure out how to deal with this problem. So they went to the New Jersey Supreme Court and they pulled the case from New Jersey. So I'm trying to do the same thing here with the Florida um, Supreme Court's case. So I'm drawing an analogy there for the most part. I am mentioning that the act complies. What is this? What act? Oh, my efforts. My efforts. Okay, so I filed a claim with the depart with the Department of the Unclaimed Property Division seeking my ex's unclaimed property pursuant to the law as required. And that by doing so, I'm satisfying the exhaustion of administrative remedies doctrine. I might do a video on that, guys. Very short, I will say that there is this doctrine that says that before you go to court, you should try to exhaust all of your administrative remedies first. And so what I'm stating here is that I sent a letter or what in whatever, maybe I sent an application or a form or something to um, the Department of Treasury's Unclaimed Property Division and that me by doing that is satisfying um, the exhaustion of uh, administrative remedies doctrine. Um, so I may, I, I can see here that I've attached it as exhibit one. So we'll take a closer look at this to see what it actually is. Let's see. I'm simultaneously requesting that this court designate an entitlement to my ex's property consistent with the law. So so there's a statute, 21.320. I'm gonna take a closer look at this down in the footnotes. At this court's preference, a sufficient finding consistent with the law could be ordered in which case a preliminary examination of the secretary would occur in open court. Witnesses may be required to appear and testify before the judge under this chapter in the same manner as upon the trial of an issue. Oh yeah, I forgot about this. This is an interesting little statute here, NRS 21.310, which allows you not only to subject your ex to a debtor's exam, but also to call in other people who aren't even connected to the case to ask them where they might, you know, you know, what might they know about a person's assets so that you can then use that information to seize the money. Discovery Commissioner referral. I'm requesting the matter be referred to the Discovery Commissioner on several occasions. Commissioner Wes Hayes has heard discovery issues and may be more familiar with the facts concerning execution on my ex's assets. This is true. He's participated in this at least twice and he's done a great job. Intervention. To the extent that the DCFS or the Secretary may want to intervene, they have the opportunity to do so by um, trying to quash the subpoenas. So I'm just mentioning to the court, if they have a problem with it, they'll make themselves known. The reason I have to tell the court this is because it seems to me like the court just wants to do anything in its power to just defend everyone else from me, which is frustrating and has led to two reversals so far. Um, not only frustrating, but legal error. 
conclusion, this is a gigantic conclusion, <laughs> but I think what I'm trying to say here is that my ex owes me money, the Secretary of Treasury is holding her money, please give it to me. That's a lot of stuff there. Um, declaration of me is swearing under penalty of perjury that the facts alleged in this document are true and correct. Rule 5 certificate of service indicating this document was mailed to my ex. Notice opposition sheet, which indicates I do not have to pay a $25 filing fee to file this. And we got two exhibits. This is what I want to take a look at here. Exhibit one. Okay, yeah. So this is the application that you're supposed to fill out and send in. Um, I don't mind if you guys want to take a look at this. Looks like there is money owed to my ex. PayPal money, money from Amazon. Maybe she's owed, a, yeah, a refund. It looks like she's owed a refund. Um, so I was just trying to seize this money here. This is just the remainder of the form. I'm going to make sure that there are no social security numbers in that document. Doesn't look like it. Oh, it's X'd out, so that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Exhibit two. Oh, this is the order for service by publication. I'm probably mentioning this in the conclusion. If you guys want to read that gigantic conclusion, go ahead. But I'm probably saying something like, hey, nobody knows where she is. So if money isn't seized, it's not going to be obtained. Um, and again, as my standard policy is with the My Docket series, I don't go over documents that I've already gone over. So if you want to really read through the order for service by publication as well, go down in the description below, click on the link, download for yourself, and take a look at it. Mention down in the comments below if you think that I missed something that I should have covered. Here we have a request for submission. Um, if you want to know more about the request for submission, please watch my video on the topic, request for submission. Basically, I'm submitting this motion to the court for consideration. My ex failed to file an opposition. Rule 5 certificate of service indicating this document was mailed to my ex. Declaration regarding letter from the Secretary of Treasury. So it looks like I got a letter from the Secretary of Treasury and I'm providing it to the court. Rule 5 certificate of, uh, certificate of service indicating I'm sending this document to my ex. List of exhibits, we have the letter. Exhibit one. Dear claimant, we have completed our initial review of your claim and supporting documents based on what you have provided. It is necessary for you to submit additional documentation. Please provide a copy of the legal documentation showing you are authorized to collect on behalf of the owners. Final order from judge. Okay, this makes me even matter. <laughs> matter is not a word, but I'm saying it as a joke. Guys, I'm going to talk about why I am angry in the next video in my docket series. I forgot about this. So I remember that this gets denied, but I forgot that I got a letter a letter from the Secretary of Treasury saying, this is all we need to give you your money. So oh, this is why I created Our Nevada Judges. <laughs> Let's talk about this a whole lot more in the next um, the next video on the series. Or maybe, maybe yes, next year, because I think the next video is the order denying. So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and wait to get mad and then I'll mention it next video. But this letter is going to be 99% of the reason as to why I am angry and why over and over again, the judges in my cases drive me absolutely up the wall. Um, okay guys, let's move on. Going into the aftermath, I filed three documents. They were all free filings, so I incurred $0 in costs. My ex didn't file anything, so she incurred $0 in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred $0 in attorney fees. Max didn't have an attorney either, so she incurred $0 in attorney fees as well. As my previous videos, feel free to post any questions you have down in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.